What's up, I'm Vin, and today I wanna to go through the June 2022 Algebra 2 regions. So let's get started. So we're starting off here with the part one multiple choice. There are 24 questions and each one is worth two credits. So first up here, we have for all positive values x, which expression is equivalent to x to the 3 fourths power? Now just know anytime you have a rational exponent or an exponent in the form of a fraction, I always like to think here power over root, that the number on top tells you the power and the number on bottom tells you the root. So if I want to transform x to the 3 fourths power, I could rewrite this as the fourth root of x to the third power like this. So now we just scan the answer choices and this is going to match choice one. Question two, we have Mrs. Favada's statistics class and they want to conduct a survey to see how students feel about changing the school's mascot's name. And now we have which plan is the best process for gathering an appropriate sample. Now the key is when you're gathering a sample, you want it to be as random as possible. So that's the theme with these questions. You want it to be as random as possible. So if we were to survey students in a random sample of senior homerooms, that's not so random because if you're at a high school, you have freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors. So if you're only surveying seniors, they're different than the other grades. So it's gonna have a bit of a biased opinion. So now, if you survey every 10th student entering art classes, well then these are the students that are good at art, and if they're, you're just mainly surveying art students, you're not really getting a wide sample of the whole school. So I would say this one is out as well. And now we're surveying every fourth student entering the cafeteria during each lunch period. Now this is as random as possible because everyone in the school is going to eat food at some point of the day. So surveying people in the lunchroom, you're going to get people who like art, who like history, who are on sports teams, who are in different clubs. So this is as random as possible. And I'll just rule out the last one. If we just survey members of the school's varsity sports teams, that's not that random. Three is the most random, so that's our answer. So question three, we have given x is not equal to negative three, we want to see what is this expression equivalent to. Now they have to specify that x is not negative three so that this is not undefined. And for this, we're going to do we're going to go ahead and do the long division here. So we have 2x to the third plus we have 7x squared minus 3x minus 25. So we could also do synthetic division here, but I think this is the more popular one that's more widely taught across schools. So what we have is we're going to just do the leading terms here. So we're going to say x goes into 2x to the third, 2x squared times. So right away I'm ruling out choice four because there should be a 2x squared in front. And now when we distribute 2x squared times x is 2x to the third, and when we multiply it by three, we're gonna get 6x squared. And then what we do is we subtract this row from the previous one, so these terms cancel, and then seven minus six is gonna give us one, so we're gonna have one x squared, and then we bring down the minus three x. And we start this process all over. So now we're asking ourselves, how many times is this x going to x squared, and it's gonna go in x times. So right away, I get rid of this one because it has a 13x so now it's between choices one and three and now we distribute x times x is going to give us x squared and then x times three is going to give us 3x so now we subtract and notice here when we subtract this time x squared minus x squared cancels but we're going to have minus 3x minus positive 3x is going to give us minus 6x and then we drag down this minus 25 here so now we're going to do this once more except this time what we have is x goes into minus 6x. It's going to go in minus 6 times. And if we do minus 6 times x, that gives us minus 6x. And if we do minus 6 times 3, that gives us minus 18. So now we're subtracting this row from the previous, and we just have to pay real close attention here to the remainder. But look, at this step here, I'm going to go with choice 1, because notice choice 3 has a minus 13, not a minus 6. So this one is out. But just to verify here that this does check out, if you do minus 25 minus minus 18, that becomes a plus 18. And if you just think about it, minus 25 plus 18 works out to minus 7. So this is our remainder. We have a remainder of minus 7. So I would have minus 7 divided by, we were dividing by x plus 3. So that's why this is definitely matching up with choice 1. So question 4, there's a lot going on here. But for questions like this, I like to make a Venn diagram. So what we have is we have brown hair. So brown hair is going to go here. And then we have blue eyes. So I'm going to go ahead and just write blue over here. Now I know it's hair versus eyes, but this should be enough to 
get the message across. So we have 20 people have brown hair, 22 people have blue eyes, and 15 have both. I always like to start with both here. So I'm going to put 15 in the both category, which is where they overlap. So now I just do a little bit of simple math. Once again, 20 people have brown hair. So if 20 people have brown hair in total and 15 have both, that means 5 is going to go here. And now 22 people have blue eyes. That means 7 is going to go here because this 15 plus 7 has to equal 22. So now we want to know how many people have neither brown hair nor blue eyes. So how many people are not in this category here? So if you just add those up, we're going to have 5 plus 15 plus 7. But this total, we're going to subtract from the total amount of people in the group, which is 40. So if you do 40 minus, this is going to work out to 20 plus 7, which is 27. 40 minus 27 is equal to 13. So this is definitely choice 2. For question 5, we have a graph of h of x, and we want to know which equation could be used to represent the graph shown below. So what jumps out at me first is that we have a reflection over the x-axis to get from this graph to this graph, because you could see that this is a mirror image over the x-axis. So once again, we have a reflection, a reflection in the x-axis. Now, what this tells me is we need to think about what is the formula for reflecting a function over the x-axis. And just know, if you're sending f of x over the x-axis, you just throw a minus in front, and this will send it over the x-axis. If, let's say, we wanted to send the function over the y-axis, well, for a y-axis transformation, what you do is you replace the x with minus x, like this. So, once again, if you send... Uh, if you replace x with minus x, that will reflect a function of the y-axis. So now we're just looking for one where we have this specific transformation for reflecting in the x-axis. And if we look at the answer choices here, this is going to match up with choice 3, because if we're starting with h of x, throwing a minus in front will just flip it over the x-axis. So question 6 is a nice conceptual question. We have a polynomial p of x, and we're told if p of 3 is equal to 0, what conclusion can we draw from this? And what jumps into my mind immediately is that when we are told that a specific value of x makes our function equal to 0, this tells us that x equals 3 is a root. So if x equals 3 is a root, we have to think about how do we get to that point where our solution is x equals 3? Well, what we have right before it, we would have something like x minus 3 times maybe a whole bunch of stuff is equal to 0 because we take the factors, we set them equal to 0, and we solve for x. So we're kind of working backwards here. If x equals 3 is a root, this tells us that x minus 3 is going to be a factor of the function p of x. Question 7, I'll show the work in this space over here, and we want to know the solution to this equation. So the first thing that jumps out at me is that I would just divide both sides by 5 like this. And now 5 over 5 cancels, and we're going to have e to the x plus 2 is equal to 7 fifths. And now from this step, we have to know what is the opposite of e. Well, the inverse function for e is going to be natural log. So we're just going to do the natural log of both sides like this. So we have the natural log of the right side and the left side. And now natural log and e cancel out. And this leaves us with x plus 2 is equal to natural log of 7 over 5. And now to solve for x, just subtract 2. So we have x equals natural log of 7 fifths. And then we just tack on the minus 2. And this is going to work out to choice 1. The only difference here is that the minus 2 is in front. So minus 2 plus natural log is the same thing as natural log minus 2. So definitely choice 1. Now for question 8, we could do this by hand, but we are allowed to use a calculator for the region. So let's just switch over to the calculator view. So for this question, we could go to apps. And number 9, I believe that stands for polynomial simultaneous. And there's a 2 in front. But what we're going to do is we're going to do a simultaneous equation solver. So we're going to go with number 2 here. And for this one, we're going to have three equations. And we have three unknown variables. There's an x, y, and z. So we just have to make sure that we set this up first. And now to hit next, we're going to press the graph button. And now once we go here, we're just typing in. It was 1x. And then we had plus 2 times y. So we're just writing in the coefficient 2. And then we have minus z. So I could put a minus here. And then after this, I could put a 1 in front of the z. Another way of doing it is you could say plus negative 1 times z, but either way, this is going to work out fine. And this was equal to 1. So now we just repeat this process, but we write in the coefficients. We had negative x, so I'm just going to put the oh invalid input. So let's just make sure we're going to put a negative 1 in front. So I'll just clear this out. We're going to do negative 1. And there we go. So we have negative 1x, and then we have minus 3 times y. 
and then we have plus 2 times z. So plus 2 times z like this. And now this is equal to 0, so that part we just hit enter, and we'll move on to the next row here. We have 2x, and then we're going to have minus 4 times y, and then we have plus 1z, so plus 1 times z, and this one is equal to 10. So once we type everything in, this is just a, like a quick process here. If we just type everything in. Now we just press graph to solve this, and our solution is x equals 3, y equals negative 1, z equals 0. So number 8, we have x equals 3, y equals negative 1, z equals 0 is choice 2. All right, question 9, there's a lot going on. We have this massive formula here for mortgage payments where capital M is the monthly payment, P is the amount borrowed, and we have R is the annual interest rate, and N is the total number of monthly payments. So now I would just define variables and then type the rest of this in a calculator. So Adam is taking out a 15-year mortgage. So if N is the total number of monthly payments, we have to think here that N is going to be equal to, there's 15 years to pay this mortgage, and there's 12 months in a year. So we're going to be making 15 times 12 payments. So this tells us here, if we work this out, that N is equal to 180. And now after this, what we have is the principal amount. How much are we borrowing? We're borrowing, or Adam's borrowing, 240000 So that's the value for P. And now the R value here, 4.5%, we have to express as a decimal. So if you just do 4.5 divided by 100, you're going to get 0 0.045 like this. So now the rest, we just type this into the calculator. So if we go back to the main screen here, so we're just going to press second mode to quit this. I highly recommend when you're typing in fractions to write alpha y equals enter. And it'll pull up a blank fraction like this. So we had capital P, which was 240,000. So that's our first input value here. And then we had R divided by 12. So remember, R was 0 0.045. So we're dividing that by 12. And then next we have 1 plus. So we have 1 plus. The interest rate, once again, is 0 0.045. And then we're dividing by 12. And we're raising this to the N power. But remember, N was equal to 15 times 12, or 180. So we're just going to tack on a 180 here. And the denominator was 1 plus, so now we just write it, we have 1 plus the interest rate, so still 0 0.045, divided by 12. And this is being raised to the n power, n is still 180. And then we're tacking on a minus 1 at the end of all this. So our monthly payment is going to be 1835.98. So number 9 is choice 3. So question 10, we have f of x and g of x, and we want to know what is f of x minus g of x. And this is for all values x. So for this one here, I would just plug in, and we have to know x minus 3 squared is the same thing as doing x minus 3 times x minus 3. So what I have here, if I want to find f of x minus g of x, f of x, we just expand this here, is going to be x squared. We would have minus 3x, so we have x squared minus 3x minus 3x, which would give us minus 6x. And then minus 3 times minus 3 gives us 9. And now I have minus, and we have to watch out for this trap here. When you're subtracting a polynomial, please make sure to put it in parentheses, because if you only subtract the first term, that's just going to throw off the whole question. So now g of x is equal to x plus 3 times x plus 3. So if we expand this, we have x times x is x squared. Then we would have plus 3x plus 3x, which gives us plus 6x. And then 3 times 3 at the end is 9. So that brings us here, and now if we work this out, this is x squared minus 6x plus 9, and if we distribute the negative, we get minus x squared. Then we have to distribute the negative here, we get minus 6x, and we get minus 9. So almost everything cancels out. The x squares go, and then 9 minus 9 cancels, but minus 6x minus 6x gives us minus 12x, so this is definitely choice 3. Question 11, we have f of t, and this represents the mass in grams of carbon-14 remaining after t years. And this is what we want to know, which statements must be true. So if we go through these one by one, for Roman numeral one, we have the mass of carbon-14 is decreasing by half each year. Well, just know that T is modeled with years. So if the mass is decreasing by half each year, that means if we were to plug in, let's say, T equals zero, T equals one, that this thing would just keep getting chopped in half every time we go up by a year. But the problem with that is that we have t divided by 5,715. So this would actually take 5,715 years to cut things in half. So Roman numeral 1 is out for that reason because 
once again, if we look at this, if we have 50 times 0 0.5 to let's say the one over 5,715, this would be t equals one. If we were to go forward one more year, we would have 50 times 0 0.5 to the two over 5,715. So if you were to compare these values here, this new value is not gonna be half of the original. So once again, that's why Roman numeral one is out. So this is out, this is out, and now it's between two and four. So now we have to fact check Roman numeral two. And if we go forward with this one, the mass of the original sample is 50 grams. And to check this one, the mass of the original refers to time t equals zero. And if you were to plug in t equals zero, you would have f of zero equals, and we'd have 50 times 0 0.5 to the zero over 5,715 would give us to the zero power. And then 0 0.5 to the zero is equal to one. So this would just be equal to 50 and the mass is grams. And notice what they told us here, that they told us the mass of the original sample is 50 grams, and this worked out to 50. So Roman numeral two is true, which means choice two is our answer. So question 12, we have a graph of G and a table for T of X. And we're talking about the interval from two to four. We wanna know which statements regarding the average rate of change for G and T is true. So the first thing that's jumping into my head for this is when I hear average rate of change, I automatically think of this formula. So we have F of B minus F of A over B minus A. So that's where my attention shifts. And since we're going from two to four, I'm gonna look at this graph here at X equals two. I just count up, we're going up one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is the point two, six. And if we go out to four, we're going over two more. We're going up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is the point four, ten. So what I would do is I would find the average rate of change for both of these. So for G of X, the average rate of change we could say here is 10 minus six. So now we're just finding the slope over four minus two. And then we get four divided by two, which is two. So this is once again for G of X on the interval from two to four. But now if we find the average rate of change for T of X, this will be a little bit easier because for this one, what we're doing is T of four minus T of two over four minus two. And for this one, we have a table, so we don't have to rely on our ability to count. So T of four, is gonna be equal to three. So this is equal to three minus, and then we have t of two is negative five. So we have three minus negative five divided by two, and this gives us eight divided by two, which is equal to four. So the first observation that I make here is that t of x has a greater average rate of change than g of x. So if we look here, g has a greater, this is not true, they are not equal. The average rate of change for g is twice the average rate of change for t is not true, but here's the one, the average rate of change for G of X is half the average rate of change for T of X because this is two and that's definitely half of four. So choice four is our answer. So for question 13, we have the directrix is the line Y equals three and we have the vertex of our parabola. And we wanna know where is the focus of the parabola? So for this question, you could know a bunch of formulas for this, but honestly, I can never remember formulas. So I have to think about the concept involved. And what I know about a parabola is that if it looks like this, if it's smiling at us, what we have is we have a focus here. So this is our focus. And then the directrix is right under it because the concept is that a parabola is the same distance. Any point on this parabola is the same distance away from the focus as it is from the directrix like this. And if we're using the vertex, it's a straight run like this. The distance from the focus to the parabola is equal to the distance from the parabola to this line, the directrix. But the other way this could work out is we could have a parabola that's frowning at us. And in this case, what we would have, we would have the line, the directrix going above like this, and the focus would be underneath like this. And once again, it's still upholding that idea that any point on this parabola, the distance from here to the directrix is equal to the distance from here to the focus. A lot of talking for that part, but now we go ahead and draw this out. They told us the equation for the directrix. And they said it's the line y equals three. So if I go up here, one, two, three. So our line is going like this. So this is the line y equals three. The next thing we were told is the vertex. And the vertex is at the point two, one. So that's gonna be over here. And notice this is the second case where the directrix is above the vertex. Uh, so this is the, once again, the vertex referring to the turning point of the parabola. So that means our parabola is gonna be opening this way. And remember the concept that the distance from the directrix 
to the parabola is equal to the distance from the parabola to the vertex. I'm sorry, from the parabola to the focus. So this distance here, we just have to count. This is the point 2, 3, and the vertex is at the point 2, 1. So how far away are these points? You could just count. We're going up 1, 2. So there's the distance. So the focus has to be two units away from the vertex. So that means we would go down two from the vertex. We're going down one, two like this. And that's where our focus is. But now we just have to assign a coordinate here. Since we went down two units from a y value of one, we're going down to negative one. And this location is two negative one, which would correspond to choice one. All right, question 14, not to be negative here, but this is one of my least favorite questions I've encountered in a long time because I like when you get something exact. But we have the heights of 3,300 students at this high school are approximately normally distributed with an, a mean of 65.5, and we have a standard deviation of 2.9. And we want to know here the number of students at Ocean View who are between 64 and 68 inches tall is closest to. So for these questions, I almost immediately just draw this out. So let me just do my best to make this neat. So I'm going to draw a normal bell curve here. So here's our bell curve, and the average always goes at the top. So we have 65.5 going at the top here. And the average is zero standard deviations away from the average because it is the average. And now if I go one standard deviation this way to the right, I would add 2.9 to 65.5. You know, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger here. So let me just expand this out a little bit so we can really see. So if we were to add 2.9 here, we would get 68.4. So 68.4 would bring us here. And this is pretty close to 68. So I'm going to stop. Now, watch what happens if we subtract 2.9 from the average. If we were to subtract, that would send us one standard deviation back this way. But the problem with that is that it would throw us to 62.6. So once again, if you did 65.5 and you subtracted the standard deviation of 2.9, this one here, if we do the math here and work this out, is going to work out to 62.6. And the problem is that that's pretty far away from 64. So then we say, what if we were to take the standard deviation and cut it in half? Well, this would be equal to, we would have 1.45 like this. And if we subtract that from 65.5, so we do 65.5 minus 1.45 like this. Now I just tack on a zero here. This, we could just work this out, is going to work out to, we would have 64.05, which is way, way, way closer to 64. So a little bit of a sneak attack here is that we're going to go half of a Steven, half of a standard deviation to the left, which brings us once again to 64.05. And we're going to go one full standard deviation to the right. So we're focusing on this space here. So we're going from here all the way to here. But now one thing that is given to us in, uh, you know, if you have notes on standard deviation is that this space here is 31 point, 34.1% of all the scores, but or in this case, all of the heights. But if we go half a standard deviation this way, this is 19.1%. And this piece from the half to the full standard deviation is 15%. So that's how the 34.1 is made up. So once again, we're trying to see the number of students between 64 and 68. So that means we're going to be focusing on this slice here. So that means we're going to go half a standard deviation to the left and a full standard deviation to the right. So we have to add these percentages together. So we're going to do 34.1 plus, and then we have 19.1. And if we work this out, this is going to work out here to 53.2%. So now we're going to take 53.2% of 3,300. So I have 3,300 times 53.2%. I could express as 0.532 like this. And if we work this out, this works out to 1755.6. And now if we look at the answer key here, the one that we're closest to, where a little less than 100 away from choice one, but this one we would be even further away from, and this one, and then 2244 would be us going way, way, way too far forward. So this would be almost 500 units forward from this amount. So this one we're closest to, but the reason I don't like this question is that this number is still pretty far from this question. So choice one is our answer. Question 15, we wanna know which statement about f of x is true, and we're gonna use the calculator for this. So for this one, we'll go to the y equals, and we're going to write in the function. We have uh, we have negative log, 
and then we have x plus 4 inside the parentheses and then we'll close the parentheses and we're going to write plus 2 on the outside. So here's our function. We'll press zoom 6 just to make sure we get a nice picture and let's go ahead and borrow this. So while the calculators of today are awesome, what I like to think about for questions like this is I think about the standard graph of log x which uh, we can think of as the parent function here. So for just the graph of log x, the point, so this was log x, one zero is a point on this graph and it looks something like this. Now what I know about log x is that the y-axis is a vertical asymptote like this and this graph will go on to infinity like this. So that's one thing I keep in mind because when you use the calculator, the picture is nice but it doesn't exactly like tell the best story. So looking at this, I could see here, if I go to the left, 1, 2, 3, 4, it looks like here at negative 4 that we have a vertical asymptote. So once again, the calculator is nice, but you have to be able to do part of the thinking here to complete the picture of the calculator. So this calculator will give us a start, but what we have to be able to fill in is that at x equals negative 4, we have a vertical asymptote. And that's going to help us answer this question because without even looking at the answers here, I'm going to see here that as x approaches negative 4 on the right side, we're going up to positive infinity like this. So this one, 15, is looking like choice 4. Now, the one lazy detail about this question is that there's nothing going on to the left of negative 4. So what they really are saying here, if I had to make this a better question, is that x is approaching negative 4, and we're going to say here from the right side because once again, there is no graph on the left side of x equals negative 4, but we're approaching negative 4 from the right side, and as we get closer to x equals negative 4, the graph is going up to infinity. Question 16, we have a researcher that wants to determine if room darkening shades cause people to sleep longer, and we want to know which method of data collection is most appropriate. So we have a census, a survey, observation study, or a controlled experiment. Well, in this case, a controlled experiment would work best because we would put some people in a room without these room darkening shades and some people in a room with the room darkening shades to see if it has any difference on the quality of their sleep. And I'm sure they would select people that have around roughly the same average amount of hours of sleep each night, but choice four is looking like the best. So question 17 is all algebra. When we're finding the inverse of a function, I think of this as y equals this function of x. And when you want to find the inverse, just switch the x's with the y's and then solve for y. So instead of y equals this, we're going to have x equals negative 6y plus a half. So then from here, we're solving for y. This is the variable that we want. So we just start doing the opposite operation. So we're going to do minus a half on both sides. So we subtract a half. And what this is going to give us, we're going to have x minus a half is equal to negative 6y. And then from this step, we're going to divide everything by negative 6. So we're going here like this, divide everything by negative 6. And now we just have to match it to how it's written in the answer key. But now we have y equals, and then there's an invisible 1 in front. So I could write this as 1x over negative 6, or I could call it negative 1 over 6 times x. And just know when we do negative 1 over 2 divided by negative 6, and let me just write this in a better spot here. So I'll write this over here. We have negative 1 over 2 divided by negative 6. If I call it negative 6 over 1, we could do keep, change, flip. And we have a negative times a negative is positive. And then 1 over 2 times 1 over 6 is 1 over 12. So if you can't do that part in your head, just do keep, change, flip on the side. And that's going to get us here. And now we could just match this. Our inverse function is going to match to choice 3. Question 18, we could do polynomial division, but there's a cooler way to do this. And to do this question the slick way, just know when you have something like a plus b over c, that's the same thing as this. You could say a over c plus b over c. However, please don't ever say that this is true. This is not the same thing as this. And that's this algebra is not allowed. This is perfectly fine. So this one, what jumps to mind right away is just rewriting the top as x squared plus 3 plus 9 like this over x squared plus 3. And then what I want to do is I'm going to break this into two fractions. So I'm going to call this first x squared plus 3 over x squared plus 3. And then I'm going to separate the 9 into a separate fraction like this, where once again, I'm just using this property of algebra. And now this simplifies really nice. x squared plus 3 divided by itself is 1. So I get 1 plus 9 over x squared plus 3. So this is going to match to choice 2. Question 19 is so easy that it's difficult. We're given this diagram for angle theta on the unit circle, and we want to know which value represents the radian measure 
of angle theta. So for this one here, just know when we're talking about radians, this refers to the intercepted arc on the unit circle. So this is how radians are defined. It talks about the measure of the intercepted arc on the unit circle. So the reason I say this question is so easy that it's difficult is that the measure of the arc that's intercepted by theta is equal to two, and that's simply our answer. Now to convince you of this, circumference in general is equal to two times pi times r. So if I'm on the unit circle, I have a radius of one, my full circumference would be two times pi times one, which is two times pi. And two pi, a bad approximation would be to say 6.28, if I did 3.14 times two. And notice that if the whole spin is 6.28ish, this spin, roughly one third of it is equal to two. So that's how I'm 100% sure here that the measure of angle theta in radians is gonna be equal to two. Question 20, we're talking about the depth of water in Thunder Bay, and we have this function here for the depth. And before I look at any answer choices, let's just get a graph of this. So we'll go over to the y equals, and it's very important that we stay in radians for this one. And what we have is we have five times sine, and then in front of our parentheses, we have pi over six. So we have pi over six, and then we're gonna open a new set of parentheses, and t minus five, we could just write x minus five. We have to close the parentheses around x minus five, and then we have to close it around the argument of the sine function. Then we could tack on our plus seven. So just make sure your parentheses are good because it could throw off the whole question. Now, when we press graph here, you don't really get the best picture of what's going on. So what I would do for a question like this is I would adjust the window and let's say I go up to a Y maximum of 20. So we play this game here and notice that it gives us a good picture of what's going on. But another nice little trick for zooming, you could press zoom number one, zoom box. And if I scroll out here like this, it's kind of like cropping a photo when you use zoom box. You could press enter. So let me just make the space here. I press enter once. I'm gonna drag this down and then I'm gonna drag it across and notice here that it's making our rectangle. So let me try that again, zoom number one, because that actually didn't look like anything was happening. So I'm gonna press enter once and then I'm gonna go up, here it is. So this is much better. And I drag it across and once again, it's just like cropping a photo. So that's gonna give us this picture here. And this is what we'll borrow to go through our answer choices. One other thing we could borrow too is let's get a table of values. So if we look at the graph here, we press second graph and we could scroll around. What we could do is we have the picture, but let's go ahead and borrow some of these values here. So this table will be useful just in case we don't feel like counting too much. So we have a low tide, and remember we wanna know which statement is false. So don't just say, oh, this is true and pick the wrong answer. That would be very depressing. So we have a low tide occurred at 2 a.m. So at t equals two, notice this is a low point here. So this one's a true statement. So that means we're gonna exit out because we want the false one. The maximum depth was 12 feet. And if we look here, it looks like the biggest number in the list is 12. And let's just make that a little bit finer here. So I'll make this smaller. So this is our biggest y value, 12, and it occurs at t equals eight. So if we count out here, notice we're going at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is also a true statement. The maximum depth was 12 feet and that occurs at t equals eight hours after midnight. And now we have the maximum depth, I'm sorry, the water depth at 9 a.m. was approximately 11 feet. So look here at t equals nine. So t equals nine gives us 11.33, which this is a nice statement here, approximately 11 feet, 11.33 is pretty close. Now the last one here is looking like the false one just by eliminating all the others, but let's see here. The difference in water depth between high and low tide is 14 feet. Well, if we look here, low tide was at two, high tide was at eight. And if we do 12 feet minus at T equals two, we had a depth of two feet. The difference should be equal to 10 feet, but they're saying here it's 14 feet. So that's why this statement is false. So definitely choice four. So question 21, we have a nice recursive function. And I know it's recursive because we have A sub N and A sub N minus one represents the term before A sub N. So here we're starting with a sub one equals eight. So when I wanna find a sub two, this refers to when n is equal to two. So let me just make this much neater. So we have n equals two, and that would give us a sub two equals a sub, and if I plug in two, I get two minus one, which is one. And I have plus log base, and once again, if n is equal to two, two plus one is three. So I have log base three of, and if we plug in two, we get two minus one, which is equal to one. And this is gonna be equal to a sub one is eight plus, and log base three of one is equal to zero. 
You could use the calculator to check this out. So if you don't know how to do logs in the calculator, you press math, you go up, and I gotta get out of fraction. So math up log base is letter A here. And the reason why we go to this one is when we have a base like three, there's no button on the side for that. So we have to make a custom one. And log base three of one, we can see here is equal to zero. So I'm able to do this in my head though. And if you wanna see a little trick for doing these in your head, is I turn the log into exponent form. So the base is three. So I say in my head three to the blank power is equal to one. And I know that three to the zero power equals one. So that's how I know this simplifies to zero. And then eight plus zero is equal to eight. So that's a sub two. So now when I wanna find a sub three, that's when n equals three, I'm gonna get a sub three equals, and now I have a sub three minus one is two, plus, and then we have log base, we have n plus one, so three plus one is four, and now what we have is we have three minus one going here, and three minus one is two, and this is gonna work out to a sub two, we already said was eight, so we have eight plus log base four of two, so we could evaluate this part in our head. Log base four of two, what I'm thinking of here is I'm saying four to the blank power is equal to two. So I know we have to make the base smaller. So that means our exponent is gonna be a fraction here. And this we could say it's four to the one half power because four to the one half is the same thing as the square root of four, which is equal to two. So this is gonna work out to eight plus a half and eight plus a half I could say is 8.5, which matches choice two. Question 22, we want to know which function has a maximum y value of 4 and a midline of y equals 1. So right away, I could eliminate this graph that they gave us because, yes, we have a maximum of 4, but if we look here at y equals 1, this is not going to count as a midline because while we're going three units up from the midline here, we're going to go infinitely south in this direction here away from the midline. So there's no real nice equidistance from the midline in graph in the graph in choice one, so this one's out. And for this one here, this one doesn't have a maximum y value of four because we have arrows going this way. So this graph is just going up, up, up to infinity. So this doesn't have a max value of four. So that means we're gonna have to do a little bit of legwork here and graph the graph in choice two and choice four. So for g of x, we want negative three cosine x. And let's make sure we get out of this because it's cosine x with the plus one on the outside. So here's our graph and we're just gonna take a screenshot of this. So now we'll go ahead and label this as g of x, and now let's graph the second one. So j of x, we could say, was four sine x. Let's clear this out. We have four sine x, and let's close the parentheses around sine, and then we're gonna tack on our plus one. And we'll take a screenshot of this graph as well. So one little change here, I'm just gonna make this graph pink so that it definitely stands out. But now we're gonna go ahead and run through the given conditions again. So let's start with g of x. We have a maximum y value of four. So if we look at a point like this, you can see how this lines up with one, two, three, four. So that first condition is met. And if we draw in a midline at y equals one, you could see that this is acting as the midline for this trig function because to get from the midline to this point up here, I'm going up three units like that. So there's a distance of three to this point. And then to get from here to here, I'm going from one down to negative two. So that's a distance of three as well. So this is looking like our answer. Now, why is choice four no good? Well, right away we could see we're going up one, two, three, four, five. So this has a max value of five, so it's automatically out. Definitely choice three. I'm sorry, definitely choice two. So for question 23, just be good at distributing and know that i squared is equal to negative one. So I'm gonna start by distributing the x. And if we distribute the x, x times x squared gives us x to the third. And then we have x times minus xyi is minus x squared yi. And then we have minus x y squared. And then one thing I like to do when I distribute the next thing is I write like terms underneath each other. So here I have yi times x squared, and that's going to give us plus x squared yi. So right away I see that these terms are going to cancel out. And now we have yi times minus xyi, and that's going to give us, I'll write that over here, we're going to have minus x y squared and then i times i gives us i squared. And this is the part where we use that i squared equals negative one. And then we have yi times minus y squared. And that, we could just say yi times minus y squared is minus y to the third times i like this. So now we could just combine like terms. And once again, these terms are opposite, so they're gonna cancel out. So we're gonna have x to the third minus xy squared. And then this part here, the i squared equals negative one. So think of this as, minus xy squared times negative one, which would make plus xy squared. 
So that brings us here, and then we have minus y to the third times i. But notice that these are now opposite terms that could cancel. So this simplifies to x to the third minus y to the third times i. So this is definitely choice four. Question 24, the final multiple choice question. We have the growth of a $500 investment can be modeled by this function, and t is the time in years. And this is the question. In terms of the monthly, in terms of the monthly rate of growth, the value of the investment can best be approximated by. So one thing I'll tell you this is not. Do not, this is a very dangerous trap. Do not think of this. So I'm going to say don't in all caps because I'm not telling you to do this. But don't do something like this. Like, oh, 500 times 1 plus, and in this case here, the interest rate is 0 0.03. But don't say 0 0.03 divided by 12 to the 12 T. This is a very dangerous trap. It may not show up as an answer choice here, but it's a very, very, very dangerous trap because they're not telling us that this is compound interest compounded monthly. They're telling us to express this function in terms of monthly rate of growth. So this is not what we're doing here. We have to take a different approach here. So what we're going to do is we're starting with the function P of T and P of T is 500 times 1.03 to the t power. So it's reminding me of this formula, p equals a, and then we have one plus the interest rate to the t power. So compound interest where we compound yearly. And in this case, r is equal to 0 0.03, which is the same thing as 3%. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna express this in terms of the monthly rate of growth. So we're gonna use this property of algebra that when we have a to the b to the c power, this is equal to a to the b times c. So what I want to do is I'm going to rewrite this. Instead of to the t power, I'm going to write this here as 1 over 12 times 12 to the t power like this. Now, the reason why I'm expressing it as a product so that in a moment we could shift this over and express it in terms of the monthly rate of growth. So if we go forward with this here, what we're going to do is we're going to group this a little bit different. Now we're going to write this as 500 times 1.03 to the 1 over 12, but I'm going to put this whole thing here in a bracket and say this to the 12t power. So you could see this is equal to the original. I'm not using this formula. I'm taking what we already have, and I'm just shifting its representation. So now we could say this is 500 times whatever this works out to, which we'll write in a moment when we get the calculator going. But now we just have to evaluate what is 1.03 to the 1 over 12. So let's go ahead and do that. We have 1.03. So 1.03 to the 1 12th power. So 1 divided by 12. And we could see here that we have 1.00246627. And if we look, this eliminates choices 3 and 4. And this is going to match up with choice 1 because there's our matching decimal here. We said this works out to 1.00. 2, 4, and then if we round, it's going to round to a 7 here. So this is definitely choice 1.